May I begin by thanking Professor Rahman Subhan. Uh, a few weeks ago when I opened my email uh, inbox and saw an email from him, uh, my eyes immediately perked up and it turned out that he had very kindly invited me to join this panel. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a measure of his intellectual generosity, something which again comes through this book in abundant measure that uh, he should have requested a historian from India. Uh, and uh, someone who I think, at least on this panel, uh, is the only one who was uh, born well after the creation of Bangladesh. Uh, so to that extent, I think, I think uh, you know, you, you've not only sort of reached out across countries, but generations. And uh, it, it, it was my absolute <laughs> pleasure and privilege to be able to read this book. Uh, I, I think the book is, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a remarkable memoir. And you've already gotten quite a good flavor of the person, uh, the bon vivant, that uh, Rahman Subhan is. And uh, I think it also gives you certain clues about how his generation, uh, which formed sort of friendships and intellectual camaraderie in places like Cambridge, then managed to take it uh, back to the subcontinent. And it's been a lifelong project for him to see South Asia as, as, a, as an entity uh, sort of standing together. And then uh, some of the figures that, um, uh, you know, whom he mentions and talks about, uh, particularly in, in that wonderful chapter uh, of his time in Cambridge, uh, are people who've sort of written uh, or helped write the histories uh, of their respective countries. So, so uh, it, it was absolutely fascinating to read that. What I want to do uh, in, in, in the next few minutes, really, is to sort of take a look at this book as a historian and try and say, what is it that this book adds to our sort of corpus of knowledge, understanding, uh, insight into the sort of events that it describes. And uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that, you know, I, I think it would be giving this book <coughs> a lot of short shrift simply by focusing on the Liberation War episode itself. Because the book has actually got a fantastic amount of detail on the period in Pakistan's history when Ayub Khan was president. And uh, I think in many ways that period as Professor Rahman Subhan alluded to in his remarks, is, is really the backstory that we need to be able to understand and bring out. And I think it's uh, fair to say um, that Bangladeshi historians themselves haven't gotten into this territory in um, any serious way yet. Uh, we are yet to see very serious historical scholarship coming out of Bangladesh. And uh, this memoir, which uh, is, is uh, one of the best sort of analytical reconstructions of, of that story as well. So I think, I think a lot of attention has to be paid to what was happening in United Pakistan in the 1960s. And uh, Professor Suwan's first major, I think, historiographical contribution uh, will be about the, the sort of light that, that it throws. And uh, as, as uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh mentioned earlier, uh, you know, as, as a very young economist, he actually wrote one of the first books on the political economy of Pakistan in the Ayub Khan period, focusing on this uh, institution called Basic Democracy, which was created by Ayub, uh, apparently as a sort of a grassroots democracy project, but actually one which empowered a certain kind of rural elite or bourgeoisie uh, in order to solidify the support base politically as well as economically for Ayub Khan. And, and that uh, critique, which, which I myself read uh, when I was doing uh, research, it still stands as one of the best sort of most insightful pieces on the political economy of Pakistan under Ayub Khan, uh, which, which was quite important. Mm -hmm. And we also need to understand that this was done in a very larger international dimension to it, uh, which again Professor Subhan brings out very nicely, which is the um, involvement of American economists and modernization theorists in sort of getting this model going. The Harvard advisory group uh, and Gus Papanak and others uh, whose work he sort of talks about here, uh, which he uh, of course was quite sharply critical of at that time, and rightly so, uh, was instrumental in shaping the political economy of Pakistan. And this is a very interesting decade in Pakistan's history because it was a decade when Pakistan actually witnessed reasonably rapid growth, uh, growth rates. You know, it was one of the sort of fast growing decades uh, for Pakistan. And in some ways, uh, if you asked anyone in the early 1960s, which is, you know, apart from Japan, would be the first of the Asian tigers, Pakistan was, I think, a, a reasonably good candidate to get that um, thing. And, and that was, however, done on the basis that inequality would be created deliberately and that only a certain uh, group would be allowed to sort of mobilize and accumulate capital, which was then believed to be leading to investment. And that was the model that he critiqued, picked up very early on, and critiqued in very powerful terms. And I think, I think that comes out uh, really well. And that, that in many ways was the beginning of his longer term engagement through the 60s. Uh, with, with this sort of economic policy making process in Pakistan. Uh, he was invited both uh, to critique uh, 
or comment upon the third and the fourth uh, five-year plans. Uh, but but uh, obviously, the views of him and his colleagues, uh, Nurul Islam and others, uh, were, were not very palatable to the Pakistani establishment. And that is when they sort of came up with this idea, which later became popularized as this two economies model. And in many ways, uh, as uh, has been mentioned earlier, uh, sort of was the sort of economic substratum to the six-point uh, demand, which uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman then articulated. Uh, on the six-point, uh, you know, demand itself, and, and uh, this was a point which Ambassador Deb Bukharji quite rightly picked up, uh, I think Professor Subhan is right to say that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman himself did not quite realize what its implications would be. Because when the demand was made, it was made very clearly as a pitch for autonomy within the United Pakistan. Uh, whereas by the time I think the election results were out, it was slowly coming to light that if those uh, points were actually conceded, then we were going to see a very, very loose confederal system at the very best. Uh, and, and that would in many ways mean de facto, uh, if not de jure independence uh, for East Pakistan. And I think he's, he's, he's right, and much of the historical record, I think, suggests that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman had not really thought about this thing. And again, he brings, you know, he, he, he gives that essential backdrop of the 50s and 60s, which is that we today tend to forget that in United uh, Pakistan, East Pakistan was the demographic majority. If ever there was going to be a democratically uh, held election, it was quite likely that the Bengalis would assert their numbers in majority and that the government of Pakistan could actually be run by the Bengalis. And that was the dream of successive generations of Bengali politicians, starting with Hussain Sahih Surawarti, one which uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman shared till the very last moment. And I think that comes out very clear in this book. And I think it's, it's very courageous of him to say that, because this is a point which is very often slurred over in Bangladeshi recollections. Uh, because Bangabandhu was this very important figure, father of the nation, and so on, uh, the assumption is that, you know, he from the very beginning sort of wanted an independent Bangladesh to come up and somehow sort of, you know, getting to the truth of the matter is going to take away from his accomplishments, which of course is absurd. But, you know, that is the way most nationalisms tell stories about themselves. And I think he's very courageous in, in setting the record straight about what happened. Uh, in fact, he points out quite rightly that when on the 7th of March, 1971, this is a time when the election results had come out. The Awami League was the single largest party. Uh, the Pakistan uh, you know, Constituent Assembly was to be convened on the 1st of March. It had been adjourned sine die. There was a huge protest movement, non-cooperation movement in East Pakistan. And uh, Bangabandhu was supposed to give a very important speech uh, in the race course Maidan on the 7th of March. And at that point of time, the demand was that of a unilateral declaration of independence, UDI. And the model, of course, was Rhodesia, which, which was sort of uh, you know, uh, to be... Uh, uh, and, and there was a lot of pressure on uh, Bangabandhu to do that. But I think Professor Rahman Subhan again brings out very clearly that he was, at that point of time, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was treading a very careful line. On the one hand, he wanted to keep his party together, and he knew that you know, he had to keep the Awami League uh, uh, and the leadership with him. But at the same time, he knew that the Awami League rank and file comprised of students whom uh, Professor Subhan had taught uh, in the 60s, who were uh, much more radical than the leadership of uh, the Awami League itself. And, and that dynamic comes out very clearly because uh, Professor Subhan was one of those people who had an understanding of both sides because he had taught these students, he had seen their gradual radicalization through the 60s, their involvement in the movement which led to the oath through Ayub Khan, their importance uh, in getting the electoral dominance that the Awami League did in the elections of 1970. But at the same time, uh, he, because of his involvement with the Awami League top high command leadership, uh, he was also able to see what kinds of pressures and how they want to deal with it. So uh, I, th I think his, his uh, Memoirs provide a very, very important, uh, you know, point of correction to much of, uh, I think, what passes for received wisdom, uh, both in Bangladesh and in India. Uh, and I think that's a very important thing to remember. In fact, when I was reading this, I was thinking to myself that the parallels, uh, if you will, with uh, the Pakistan uh, resolution of 1940 are actually quite striking. Because when Muhammad Ali Jinnah sort of gave that resolution, a lot of historical literature now tells you that he himself was not sure where this was going to go. And I think the six-point movement was very much along those lines. <coughs> it was not a movement which had a very clear end state in mind. What they had was a demand. The idea was that the demand would be negotiated, that possibly some compromise would be arrived at, which would give the Bengalis the legitimate position uh, in the politics uh, of Pakistan. When that was denied is when things start sort of taking course. Uh, then, of course, the, we get into a very interesting phase of the liberation war itself. And, and there, uh, I think, again, uh, the, the, the great contribution of this book is to highlight a particular dimension which we tend to forget, especially in India. Uh, 
Uh, you know, as far as the story in India is concerned, it is of that of the Bengali leaders coming into India, sort of forming this provisional government with the assistance of the government of India, the Mukti Bahini uh, and other militias being sort of trained, and then the push towards that. But the story was not quite as simple. And uh, as someone who sort of looked at the wider global dimensions of uh, the 1971 crisis, uh, I, 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 I fully agree. And uh, you know, in fact, I, I wish this book was written when I was doing my own research because it provides some very vital insights uh, into how that process happened. Uh, so as he mentioned, I mean, uh, he did come here uh, to Delhi, uh, had an opportunity to brief the uh, sort of you know, uh, Indian leadership, including uh, P.N. Huxer and others. And then once the provisional government was formed, he uh, left to sort of you know, make the case for an independent Bangladesh uh, in the major capitals of the world. And one of the very interesting parts of the story, which he uh, tells here, which uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh very perceptively sort of picked up in his own remarks, was about the economic story of 1971. Uh, because one of the things which happened immediately after the crackdown in, Pakistan, in East Pakistan, 26th of March, is that in the first week of April 1971, the Pakistanis government told the Aid to Pakistan Consortium that they would go for a moratorium on repayment of debt. Uh, because, uh, and which effectively was actually, you know, if, if the Aid to Pakistan Consortium had labeled it as a default, then Pakistan's credit ratings would have plummeted. It would have become very difficult for them to get external aid in the future. So what the Pakistanis said was that we're going to put a moratorium on repayment and that we will, you know, keep crediting money in Pakistani rupees into an account, which will then get translated into dollars and so on. And the, the entire diplomacy surrounding this aid uh, to Pakistan in those six, seven months was very crucial because the Pakistani economy was on the ropes from around the time when the crisis began. And uh, the, if the aid to Pakistan consortium, where the United States, of course, had the most dominant voice, and we all know the United States was very supportive of the Yahya Khan regime, uh, had actually managed to sort of pump in more aid, then we would have seen a very different scenario unfolding through the crisis of 1971. And I think that economic thread to that story tends to be forgotten. And, and here we get it in full detail uh, about how uh, Rehman Subhan and uh, his colleagues uh, sort of went and met officials, uh, not just in dealing with various countries, but also in the World Bank itself. Peter Cargill has mentioned, uh, Robert McNamara, and, and uh, his ability to sort of convince them that uh, you know, Pakistan's record in, East, uh, in, in, in Bangladesh uh, did not allow it to be a continued recipient of international economic aid was a very important point. And this was actually a story which continued over several months. The first Aid to Pakistan Consortium meeting happened in May, and the last one happened in September. And to get the consortium countries to say that they would not do it in the teeth of American opposition was a very, very important achievement of that period. And I think that's something that we need to remember, uh, which is that the story was not just about the Mukti Bahini and others going and liberating, but how the sort of background conditions were created where the government of Pakistan was not being continually sort of empowered. Right? So, so that's a very, very important point. Uh, the other point uh, uh, which, which sort of comes out and which again tells you something both about him as well as about uh, the book is a, a small sort of story which he mentions in the passing and uh, which again Ambassador Dev Mukherjee quite rightly sort of picked up. Uh, which is about a meeting which happens uh, in Europe of all the sort of ambassadors of Pakistan uh, to various countries coming together uh, to discuss, because Pakistan is under a lot of international scrutiny at that, by that point of time, thanks to efforts of uh, Rahman Suwan and his colleagues, uh, to decide how they want to play this. And at that point of time, uh, Ambassador Kaiser, uh, who is ambassador to China, actually uh, mentions that you know, the Chinese government does not seem disposed to militarily intervene. They will give some political support, they may give diplomatic support, but it's unlikely that they're going to sort of intervene militarily. And uh, what he mentions, of course, after that, is that two days later he met Ambassador Kaiser, who he then tells us was also his uncle, and uh, who then told him that actually, this is what we, uh, is our impression. And in fact, he said that I'm quite sure the Chinese are not going to do this. And which he then relayed back to Tajuddin Ahmed. Uh, and in fact, in my own researches, uh, one of the things, one of the interesting documents I came across in the files of Mr. Huxer was a record of this meeting of Pakistani ambassadors. Uh, I, I don't know if it came through your good offices or <laughs> through another uh, direction, but the Indian government also almost concurrently knew that this was happening. Uh, so, so this is a very, very uh, interesting sort of uh, moment in, in, in um, what was happening at that point of time. The last point, and with that I'll definitely stop, um, is I think another very important contribution of this book is to highlight the very crucial role played by Tajuddin Ahmed in the liberation of Bangladesh. Uh, 
you know, again, because of the sort of, you know, overwhelming stature of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, I think uh, Tajuddin Ahmed's contributions have not been recognized to the extent. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say, and I'm Indian, I can say this, that without Tajuddin Ahmed, it's unlikely that the government of India would have supported uh, the liberation of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. He was instrumental in keeping everyone together. Mm -hmm. He was instrumental in identifying people like Rahman Subhan and empowering them, as he said, as a 35-year-old, uh, to go and present the case. Uh, that's the kind of man he was, and I think uh, the Indian government had enormous confidence in him by the time the Liberation War began. And uh, he played a stellar role, which I think deserves more recognition. And of course, as uh, Rahman Swan himself said, one of the, and I, I would definitely agree as a historian, one of the great things about the Bangladesh Liberation War is that it's a story of young people. Uh, it's a story of people like Rahman Subhan uh, and of his cousin, uh, Kamal Hussain, uh, who was also in his mid-30s, uh, people who not only participate in the liberation of the country, but then went on to you know, make the history of Bangladesh in such an important way. Uh, you know, Rahman Subhan, of course, was involved in economic planning uh, from the very beginning. Kamal Hussain was one of the main drafters as a 35, 36 year old of the new constitution of the state, which was at that point of time, possibly one of the most progressive constitutions anywhere in the newly decolonized world. And uh, I think it's a, it's a tribute to their generation that such young people were able to play such an important role. And I very much look forward to seeing that part of the story being told in the second installment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.